Welcome to the Alchemical Empress page. I'm your host, Nicola. Today, I'd like to do a little reading from the book, The Great Cosmic Mother, Rediscovering the Religion of the Earth by Monica Jo and Barbara Moore. We've been doing a lot of talking about the work that Mama Zagbe put out for us. And I was looking for other perspectives and other books on The Great Cosmic Mother. And this is one that came across my feed. So I decided to get this one as well. And I'm just gonna do a little bit of reading today just to get a different perspective. Now, Mama Zogby warned us that our, and I'm talking about African women, our approach to this is not from a feminist standpoint because we are different. We have been here a lot longer. We don't show up in the way that, the way she was teaching in a feministic vibe. This is more about how we evolved from where we were into where we are now from just a spiritual um, disposition of being one of mama's prophetess. But this seems to give me a little bit more of a feminism type perspective on the great cosmic mother because it's coming from people that's not entirely African. Uh, and so the, I think the background kind of works a little bit differently in the way that this is perceived, but I'm going to read it a little bit nonetheless, just to see where we stand with the great cosmic mother from this perspective. So I'm going to start from chapter one, the first sex in the beginning, we were all created female in the beginning was a very female sea. For two and a half billion years on Earth, all life forms floated in the womb-like environment of the planetary ocean, nourished and protected by its fluid chemicals, rocked by the lunar tidal rhythms. Charles Darwin believed the menstrual cycle originated here, organically echoing the moon pulse of the sea. And because this longest period of life's time on Earth was dominated by marine forms reproducing parthenogenically, he concluded that the female principle was primordial. In the beginning, life did not gestate within the body of any creature, but within the ocean womb containing all organic life. There were no specialized sex organs, rather, a generalized female existence reproduced itself within the female body of the sea. Before more complex life forms could develop and move into land, it was necessary to miniaturize the oceanic environment to reproduce it on a small and mobile scale. Soft, moist eggs deposited on dry ground and exposed to air would die. Life could not move beyond the water-hugging amphibian stage. In the course of evolution, the ocean, the protective and nourishing space, the amniotic fluids, even the lunar tidal rhythm, was transferred into the individual female body. And the penis, a mechanical device for land reproduction, evolved. The penis first appeared in the age of reptiles about 200 million years ago. Our archetype, archetypical association with the snake with a phallus contains no doubt this genetic memory. This is a fundamental and recurring pattern in nature. Life is a female environment in which the male appears often periodically and created by the female to perform highly specialized tasks related to spe species reproduction and more complex evolution. Daphnia, a freshwater crustacean, reproduces several gener generations of females by parthenogenesis. The egg and its own polar body make to form a complete set of genes for a female offspring. Once annually, at the end of the year cycle, a short-lived male group is produced. The males specialize in manufacturing leathery egg cases able to survive the winter. Among honeybees, the drone group 
is produced and regulated by the sterile daughter workers and the fertile queen. Drones exist to mate with the queen. An average of seven drones per hive accomplish this act each season, and then the entire male group is destroyed by the workers. Among whiptail lizards in the American Southwest, four species are parthenogenic. Males are unknown among the desert grassland plateau and chihuahua whiptails and have been found only rarely among the checkered whiptails. Among mammals, even among humans, parthenogenesis is not technically impossible. Every female egg contains a polar body with a complete set of chromosomes. The polar body and the egg, if united, could form a daughter embryo. In fact, ovarian cysts are infertilized eggs that have joined with their polar bodies, being imp been implemented in the ovarian wall and started to develop there. This is not to say that males are unnecessary or are an unnecessary sex. Parthenogenesis is a cloning process. Sexual reproduction, which enhances the variety and health of the gene pool, is necessary for the kind of complex evolution that has produced the human species. The point being made here is simply that when it comes to the two sexes, one of us has been around a lot longer than the other. In the nature and evolution of female sexuality, Mary Jane Sherfy, MD, described her discovery in 1961 of something called the inductor theory. The inductor theory stated that all mammalian embryo embryos, male and female, are anatomically female during the early stages of fetal life. Sherfy wondered why this theory had been buried in the medical literature since 1951, completely ignored by the profession. The men who made this her story making discovery simply did not want it to be true. Sherfrey pioneered the discussion of the inductory, the inductor theory, and now with modifications based on further data, its findings are acceptable as fact of mammalian, including human development. As Stephen J. Gould describes it, the embryo in the first eight weeks is an indifferent creature with bisexual potential. In the eighth week, if a Y chromosome bearing sperm fuses with the egg, the gonads will develop into testes, which secrete and androgen which in turn induces male genitalia to develop. In the absence of androgen, the embryo develops into a female. There is a difference in the development of the internal and external genitalia, however. For the internal genitalia, the fallopian tubes and ovaries or the sperm carrying ducts, the early embryo contains precursors of both sexes. In the, pre, in the presence of or absence of androgen, as one set develops, the other degenerates. With the external genitalia, the different organs of male and female develop along diverging lines from the same precursor. This means, in effect, that the clitoris and the penis are the same organ, formed from the same tissue. The labia majora and the scrotum are one, indistinguishable in the early embryonic stages. In the presence of androgen, the two lips simply grow longer, fold over and fuse along the midline forming a scrotal sac. Gold concludes, the female course of development is in a sense, biologically intrinsic to all mammals. It is the pattern that unfolds in the absence of any hormonal influence. The male route is a modification induced by secretion and androgens from the developing test. testes. I'm sorry. The vulnerability of the male newcomer with the female environment is well known. Vaginal secretions are more destructive to the Y-bearing sperm. 
the mortality rate is higher among neonate and infant males. Within the womb, the male fetus for the first two months is protected by being virtually indistinguishable from a female. After that, it must produce large amounts of the masculinizing hormone in order to define itself as male to achieve and maintain its sexual identity. For all we know, the Near Eastern myths upon which our Western mythologies are built, those which portray the young god or hero battling against a female dragon, have some analog here in utero where the male fetus wages a kind of chemical war against becoming, re-becoming female. For now, it is enough to say that maleness among mammals is not a primary state, but differentiates from the original female biochemistry and anatomy. The original libido of warm-blooded animals is female, and the male or maleness is a derivation, a derivation from this primary female pattern. Why then did the medical men, the scientists, take longer to figure out this basic biological fact than it took them to split the atom? And why, once this fact was noted, did they turn around and bury it in professional silence for 10 years until a woman dug it up again? Why indeed? For about 2000 years of Western history, Female sexuality was denied. When it could not be denied, it was condemned as evil. The female was seen as divinely de designed to be a passive vessel, serving reproductive purposes only. In one not too ancient dictionary, clitoris was defined as a rudimentary organ, while masculinity equaled the cosmic generative force. With fraud, uh, with fraud dismissed the clitoris as an undeveloped masculine organ and defined original libido as male, clitoral eroticism was reduced to a perverse neurosis. After, even after Masters and Johnson's laboratory studies were published in the Human Sexual Response in 1966, their findings were not integrated into psychoanalytical theory. In Mary Jane Sherfrey's research during that period, she found not one work of comparative anatomy that described or even mentioned the deeper lying clitoral structures, yet every other structure of the human body was described in living detail. Even today, with our relative sophistication of 1987, we are frequently whistled at by the magazine headlines that promises breathless articles announcing the discovery of a new spot, G-spot, an X-spot located within the vagina. Within all these new spots exists the old wistful desire to deny the existence of the clitoris as a trigger organ of female organism, orgasm. Why? There is the general, generalized traditional fear of female sexuality. Further, there is discomfort with the similarity with the common origin of the female clitoris and the male penis. Women are used to hearing the clitoris described as an undeveloped penis. But men are not used to thinking of the penis as an undeveloped clitoris. Finally, and most seriously, there is a profound psychological and institutional reluctance to face the repercussions of the fact that the female clitoris is the only organ in the human body whose purpose is exclusively that of erotic stimulation and release. What does that mean? It means that for the human female, along among all Earth's life forms, Sexuality and reproduction are not inseparable. It is the male penis carrier of both semen and sexual response that is simultaneously procreative and erotic. If we wanted to reduce one of the sexes to a purely reproductive function, 
on the basis of its anatomy and quote unquote we don't it would be it would be the male sex that qualify for such a reduction not the female not the human female but they but these are only biological facts there are only biological realities as we know facts and realities can be and are systematically ignored in the service of established ideologies throughout the world today virtually all religious cultural economic and polit political institutions stand where they built centuries ago on the solid foundation of an erroneous concept a concept that assumes that the psychic passive passivity the creative inferiority and the sexual secondariness of women this enshrined concept states that men exist to create the human world while women exist to reproduce humans period if we argue that data exists no not solely biological but archaeological mythological anthropological and historical data which refutes the universality of this erroneous concept we are told to shut up because something god called god supports the erroneous concept and that's all that matters that's the final word throughout the world throughout what we know of history something called god has been used to support the denial the condemnation and the mutilization of female sexuality of the female sex ourselves today in parts of africa predominantly among african muslims but among african christians and jews and some tribal beliefs young girls are still subjected to clitoral clitoridectomy this surgery often performed by older women with broken glass or knives excises the clitoris severing the nerves of the orgasm of the nerves of the orgasm and the operation is intended to force the girl to concentrate on her vagina as a reproductive vessel in fibulation a more thorough operation removes the labia minora and much of the labia majora the girl is then closed up with thorns or required to lay with her legs tied together until her entire vagina orifice is fused shut with a straw inserted to allow passage of urine and menstrual blood on the wedding night the young woman is slit open by midwife or her husband further cutting and reclosing is performed before and after childbirth complications from these surgeries are numerous including death from infection hemorrhage inability to urinate scar tissue preventing dilation during labor painful coitus and infertility due to chronic pelvic infection infection in 1976 an estimated 10 million women were involved with this operation and something called god justified it a god who supposedly created young girls as filthy sex maniacs who must be mutilated to turn them into docile breeders The word infibulation comes from the Latin fibula, meaning a clasp. Those civilized Romans, great highway builders, also invented the techno the technology of fastening metal clasps through the prepubescies, I'm sorry, prepubescies of young girls to enforce chastity. This practice was copied by Christian crusade crusaders during the middle the early Middle Ages in Europe. They locked up their wives and daughters in metal chastity belts and then took the keys with them while they were gone, often for many years fighting for a quote-unquote god in the near east. And less through hypocrisy and racism we dismiss these practices as merely barbaric or ancient, quote-unquote. We must recall that clitoridectomies were performed in the last century on young girls and women. in both Europe and America. This surgery, very popular with 19th century Victorians, 
was inflicted on any fem female considered to be oversexed or as a punishment for masturbation or as a cure for madness. These determinations were all made by male relatives, male physicians, male clerics, and the women involved had no legal say in the matter. These are extreme examples of the, rep the repression and mutilization of female sexuality, always sanctioned, however remotely and dishonestly, by something called, quote unquote, God. All the other re repressions and mutilizations of the body, of the mind, of the soul, of our experienced female selves are so well known and documented that they need no numerization at this point. We can all make our own list. The point is this, wherever repression of female sexuality and of the female sex exists, and at the present writing of this is everywhere on earth, we find the same underlying assumptions. These are ontological assumptions, assumptions made at the very root of things about the nature of life itself. They are, number one, that the world was created by a male deity figure or God. Number two, that existing world orders or cultures were made by and for men with God's sanction. And number three, that females are an auxiliary sex who exist to serve and populate these male world orders. Number four, that autonomous female sexuality poses a wild and lethal threat to these world orders and therefore must be controlled and repressed. And finally, number five, that God's existence as a male sanctions this repression. This perfect circularity or tautology of these assumptions only helps to build, to bind them more securely around the human psyche that they are as erroneous as they are universal seems to pose no problem to their upholders. After all, wherever we go on earth, every intact institution, religious, legal, governmental, economic, military, communications, and customs is built on the solid slab of these assumptions. And that's a pretty entrenched era. In the, in the post-World War II United States, as well as in Europe, and in most of the world generally, we've gone through a secularizing period in which some of these assumptions have been loosened up and even been made to crumble under some questioning. But now the backlash is upon us. Today, folks, people for various fundamentalist religious beliefs use modern media to broadcast a very old idea that female sexuality, i.e. feminist and femi feminist demands for abortion, contraception, repro reproduction autonomy, childcare, equal pay, psychological integrity constitutes a threat to our civilization. And this amounts to a blasphemy against God. Horrors of Babylon, Darwin's theory of evolution, and the menace of world communism all somehow get subliminally mixed up in this feminist threat. For some good historic and psychological reasons, which we will explore later, but now it is enough to say that God, quote unquote God, and civilization, unquote, were, in, were loaded concepts, loaded with dynamite, that can also always be brought to an end, brought in to end an argument that cannot otherwise be refuted. Or for those who don't lean too heavily on God or who major in civilization, you can always quote an, anthro an anthropo anthropologist. I'm gonna stop here and I'm stopping at page seven. And I just wanted to reiterate a few points of my own as I read that reading, I think one of the saddest and most painful things that I see about what patriarchy has done to women 
is how it has encouraged us to treat ourselves as women, how it has made us participants in our own personal and our own um, uh, cosmic demise, if you will, in many ways. And it's going to take a huge shaking and quaking for us to come out of a lot of the dogma, a lot of the the brainwashing that we have been under for thousands of years now. I was recently recently watching uh, Iyanla Fix My Life on on YouTube. There was a um, a full episode of the Pay Sisters. Now I have heard the Pay Sisters my whole life as a Christian growing up. Their music was phenomenal. These are amazingly beautiful singers. Their music was extraordinary. Uh, Their voices are angelic. I mean, these women definitely have something special. You can tell they're special beings when you hear them sing. But they were all in pain. As I began to listen to this episode, they were there because all of them are overweight. So in True Farm, Ayanla is trying to get to the source of what's eating them as opposed to what they're eating. And all of the sisters had some major health issues. They had already lost one sister to her health issues. And um, as she began to unravel what was going on with this family, it all came back to patriarchal trauma, being raped by an uncle, being raped and molested by a brother, um father being so manipulative in trying to keep their the the talent close to him he wouldn't allow them to do anything go anywhere go to school do anything outside to think for themselves or be for themselves so they were basically mm-hmm. under extreme bondage to create the music that all of these people enjoy And even as Ayala was trying to unravel this, the dogma was so deep as she was trying to get to one sister who was struggling with lesbian um, affection, the religiosity of the dogma that was on the older sister listening was she she gave her the nice, nasty look and just couldn't even, you know, sit and allow her to express her pain, which caused her to start shutting down again. And I just thought it was interesting how religious uh, dogma has caused us because we we perpetrate this. They they we get recruited in because you can tell that something is special on us. You can see anointing on us. You can see that we are purposed people, but because we don't know where this comes from, we don't know our origin. We don't know our roots. We don't know that we were the first on the planet. We don't know, many of us don't know our true powers. We have been been manipulated against ourselves and each other. And I just thought it was really sad watching this, even as she is unraveling uh, this, this pain in these sisters on this episode. And so we have to find a way, sisters, to free ourselves The world is waiting on us to somehow, um, excuse me, unravel what we have had to live under. The tyranny and the dogma and the religious uh, bondage that we have been under so deep that we um, have to open our minds and our hearts to free ourselves. We have to free ourselves because the world is waiting on us to free the world. I was thinking about a couple of things that made that reiterates this point in my life. When I was working with children, we used to take uh, the kids to camp every summer. And uh, I had to meet, I was a, 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 a leader of the leaders, so to speak, on this camp. And so I would uh, talk to the leaders in a meeting and I would tell them, I said, listen, Uh, These kids are going to push the boundaries on you. And some of you are are going to think that it's cool to be their friend as opposed to their leader. And so you you're going to be the one that that uh, 
they feel the most unsafe around because what kids need most importantly are boundaries. They need to know that they're safe. They may push against you, but if they know that that they can only go so far with you, they they feel safer even though they might be fussing and cussing about it. But those of you who like to play like your friends with them as opposed to being their leader, uh, you're going to find out really quickly that they don't trust you. They don't feel safe around you. And they uh, feel vulnerable around you because you have no boundaries, right? And so I feel like this is what's happening in the world right now. The world is completely and totally out of control because the youngest ones on this planet have no boundaries. Why? Because mamas have been asleep. We've been asleep on the job. And not only have we been asleep on the job, we have been used against our own selves and this planet in many ways while upholding it at the same time. Now, part of it is because we were cosmically put to sleep for a time, but it's now time for us to wake up. And we have many, many, many alarm clocks going off everywhere right now. Like you have this channel, you have other people talking, you have situations that are occurring in the world, situations that are occurring in the government. Everything is saying, wake the fuck up right now. Wake up, 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 wake up. Number one, we need to wake up and heal ourselves. It is important for us to go within, to do the work that we need to do to heal ourselves mentally, spiritually, emotionally, physically, financially, in every way, shape, form, or fashion. And you're gonna need all of your energy to do that. You know, Jennifer Lewis just recently had a fall. She was in the Serengeti, a major fall. And nobody heard about anything until after she got past a certain amount of healing in her body and was able to walk down her own stairs. And I thought that was an amazing interview that she did with Robin Roberts talking about her recovery process. And one of the most poignant things she said in this whole thing was, I could not talk to, deal with, mess with anybody at that point because I needed to harness all of my energy back into myself and heal myself. And I didn't want to talk to nobody until I was able to get back up again. Now, many of you guys don't know on this particular channel, the Alchemical Empress, that I have a whole uh, healing channel called Courage to Change and that I am a life coach and I work on helping people to unravel some of the things, kind of like Ayala fixed my life. However, because I was doing the Jennifer Lewis thing, and I'm still doing that, where I'm working on harnessing my own energy back into myself right now to heal my own pain and my own stuff that I got to heal, I've taken myself completely off of life coaching right now. I'll come back to you when I feel like I'm ready, like Jennifer did. But that is just basically a lesson to tell you to do the same for yourself, women. The world is waiting on African women in particular and women in general to wake up. And in order for us to do that, we have to heal some things. We have some things in our bodies we have to learn how to heal naturally. We have some things in our hearts and minds that have hurt us deeply that we have to learn how to heal. Like these women have to heal from the pain of being molested, of being uh, attacked raped by their own relative there's some things that we have to heal mentally because we've been so brainwashed against ourselves that religious dogma is so deep that we have to come against the cognitive dissonance that many of us feel to allow ourselves to allow new information to enter in and you will know what's right because your spirit knows deep within you what is actually in alignment with its spirit with with you spiritually so we have deep work to do and if that means pulling yourself away from certain people places and things and shutting down giving your energy to your family members and friends and people that suck the life out of you shut it down and do the work because the entire planet is waiting on us to get our shit together. The whole world is waiting on mothers, women, African women in particular, but like I said, women in general, 
to come back into alignment with the cosmic mother, with this planet, so that we can set the boundaries for our wayward children all over this earth. We do that. That is a part of our mission for being back here. Many of us who are called and chosen people, you know who you are. We have an assignment. We have an assignment. And we were allowed to sleep for a while, but it's time to wake up now. And this is a part of our journey. Many of us have different things and different ways in which we are doing that. But we have to do, everybody has to do their part to come to a space where we free ourselves so that we can free our children on this planet. Uh, the last thing I would say in this is that I pray that we learn how once again to treat each other well. Not only treat yourself because, well, I will say this, when you treat yourself well and when you come into alignment with your creator and yourself in a healthy way, you automatically know how to treat your sister and your brother and your family. But a lot of times we are trying to act like we healed. And the reason that I say act like is I know that when I'm encountering somebody that's not, you know, rightfully on their journey is you don't know how to treat the people around you. You don't know how to treat people with love. And so that is one of the biggest things is you're going to have to learn to operate in a deep spirit of love. And uh, one of the things you can do, because I've seen I've seen a, a lot of this happening online when I'm online a lot uh, as far as, you know, looking at uh, information and also putting out information. Um, if you're coming back into your own level of, of healing and authenticity, stop stealing from other people. That's not that's not loving your sister. If you have information that you're using, give people the credit that you're using information. For instance, I talk about uh, the great mother. I talk about the cosmic mother. I, I talk about mommy Wata, but I'm also citing my sources. I let you know that I'm using Mama Zogby's book. I'm letting you knew, know, letting you know that I'm using the great cosmic mother. If I have my own dreams and my own intuitions and my own thoughts, I come to you that way. But I don't take other people's stuff, put it online and post it like I'm the one that created that. I literally did a whole uh, blog on authenticity. Listen to this. Authenticity. Authenticity. Meaning showing up and knowing who you are within yourself. And can you believe someone that called themselves a sister stole authenticity from me and tried to reproduce it as our own? It's not even her voice, but it's just a fact that it's in this, and it's funny that it happens that way. But like, that's an example of you don't know yourself, you're not healed and you're not trying to get healed. So therefore you don't know how to treat the person next to you. Or you don't know how to treat your sister. Uh, if you're using someone's information, cite your source, give them credit and allow yourself to number one uh show that other sister that you're in support of their work and number two show yourself honor by being able to be your most authentic self that's one way that we can treat each other better but there are many ways that we can learn to treat one another better let's do better sisters let's get ourselves together get ourselves in a position that we're we're allowing ourselves to uh, get the uploads that we need. Some people are running full-fledged in it. Some people are still coming into an awakening. Some people are like these pay sisters that are so still steeped in the dogma that they can't shake free yet. But wherever you are and whatever stage you're in, honor yourself, honor yourself well, and honor your creator, your cosmic mother, in the process of getting back up again because she, she is coming full force and she is using many of us she has awakened many of us to, to keep speaking about the great cosmic divine mother in the process of creation so that we will begin to walk in truth and a walk in according, according to the way nature has provided for us so i hope this resonates with somebody i hope that you get a chance to really like 
you know, get the book for yourself and study for yourself and see certain things for yourself and not just listen to me. But I like to trigger people to think about certain things and introduce a couple of things that may some people may not have listened to or, or um, thought about before and, and send you on your way so that you can do your own research. So until we meet again, I'm wishing you all peace. Have a great day.